What's going on, gang? Coach Joe here to talk to you a little bit about Performa Sleep. Guys, Performa Sleep has worked with industry experts to develop the ideal mattress for athletes and active people looking to improve their performance through better sleep. Guys, Performa Sleep is proud to say that every single Performa Sleep mattress is made in the USA and ships quickly from their warehouse to your door and hopefully gets in your bedroom pretty quick. Guys, I sleep on a Performa Sleep mattress. I absolutely love it. It's the only mattress on the market with copper cool technology. And I can say right now as a guy who sleeps hot, who sleeps with sweats, I don't anymore in my Performa Sleep mattress. Check it out. Folks like myself, like Dr. Danny, Lauren Fisher, Emily Bridgers, Scott Pancheck are on the Performa Sleep mattress. And I have nothing but great things to say about it. So head over to PerformaSleep.com and click their big red buy now button and enjoy. What's up, guys? Doc and Jock Podcast. It's me, Doc Danny. The other guy is Coach Joe. And the other, other guy is Alex Kazarian. Alex is a biomechanic or biomechanist who studied bioengineering, and he's the inventor of the Shoe Q. Uh, the Shoe Q is a product that I've got some exposure to recently. Um, our good friend Brian McKenzie is a very avid user of the Shoe Q. And uh, we want to have Alex on to kind of talk about the product because for us, you know, it's all about trying to keep our, our uh, listeners healthy and inform them of, you know, some cool products that are out there. And we've highlighted a few so far. So the Shoe Q is kind of next next up for us and what we want to talk about. So, Alex, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Alex, why don't, you know, I gave him a really short background, but why don't you uh, give our listeners an idea of, you know, kind of who you are before you kind of got into the inventor realm, but um, how you got kind of how you got there as well. Um, so, you know, grew up in the Boston area, um, playing sports, high school, um, you know, lacrosse and football were my main sports and was always training, lifting, working out, you know, reading everything I could to about training to, uh, to get better. And, you know, I, I always wanted to get faster. Uh, that was a big thing. And I came across kind of the, the barefoot running methodology and being more, uh, f- you know, forefoot and, you know, being more on the ball of your foot and watching, you know, people who are the faster runners do that and the slower group tending to be more, you know, heavy on their foot and on their heels. So I started training that way and I noticed I got a lot faster. Um, and then a, a, a number of other things, you know, in training, I was just always interested in it. Uh, ended up going to college to Union College in upstate New York. And I had the opportunity to study bioengineering. Um, which I wasn't totally sure what it was at the time, but it sounded interesting. I was, you know, into math and science. I was into engineering, so I gave it a shot and uh, turned into doing some research uh, on running and coming up with this concept. Talk to us a little bit about college and and how, um, you know, when I think of football players and lacrosse players, you know, I think a little, you know, I don't want to say – Duke lacrosse kind of madness, right? But obviously, those boys were innocent. They're, you know, no worries there. But yeah, yeah I think sure. of a. I, I don't see a lot of you know science and, and and stuff back there. So, what led you? What kind of put you on this bio mechanist uh, route in college? Um, I was just you know I, I was a math and science guy. I wasn't really an English guy, um, and I wanted to just I, I was just kind of curious and tried it out. I actually went in doing mechanical engineering. Uh, growing up, I've always been into building things. So whether it was, you know, a, a pig spit to roast a pig or, or you know, speakers in the garage, uh, we actually do a pig roast on the 4th of July coming up. And, uh, yeah, we have a homemade thing, you know, built parts from the dump. So I've just always been into building things. So that's kind of hence the engineering route. Oh, and then with the combined with, you know, my interest in training, I, you know, it was a good fit to try out this bioengineering thing. Um, and the bioengineering, as I didn't really know exactly what it was at the time, it turns out it's a pretty broad topic. So, you know, you have implants, you know, medical imaging, tissue healing, you know, and then as well as the biomechanics part of it, which is kind of where I chose to focus. Awesome. So this research that you did, uh, what was the, uh, the direction of that and, and, uh, and, and you know, what, what kind of stuff were you guys looking at? So I had, uh, I, I had a project where I had to basically 
read all the rel- the, the relative or relevant uh, literature on a subject and kind of compile it. And I focused on looking at the barefoot running versus shoe running because that was you know something I, I had an interest in and had messed around with, and kind of had something an idea in my head of of what I thought the the result would be, but I wanted to see what the actual science and the research said. Um, so in that research, so I, I found, you know, there's the obvious stuff. If you are familiar with barefoot running, we know that, you know, people tend to land lighter towards the ball of their foot, they, you know, as opposed to the heel striking, which we see in shod runners. And there's, you know, less of an impact associated with this forefoot strike. So that's kind of the, the obvious stuff that everyone sees if, if you take, you know, just at first glance, looking at barefoot runners or shod runners. Um, but I dug a little deeper, and there was a couple things that surprised me in there. Um, and actually, one of them was that, so I, I was pretty much a, a big advocate on we should have less shoe. Um, I never really went the whole Vibram route because I didn't uh, didn't want to wear those. They're kind of a little ridiculous looking, but... Um, they went crazy on us. You, no, you know, you know what Kelly said those were? Those, he said those are the anti get laid sho- get laid shoes. He- <laughs> exactly. Not not a good look on the college campus. <laughs> I've I've had I actually have three pairs. I wear them in the shoe in the uh I wear them when I go in the creek or when I'm when I'm oh, doing yeah. water stuff. But honestly I had to drop them because they went crazy. Their designs went nutty. Like they yeah. looked Wild, Dude, that was know. an incredible water shoe, though. I would wear them. Um, I think that's how they started. Right? They, yeah. they started that way, and then some like, hippies got a hold of them or something. But, right. Yeah. Hey, I um, did it, man. I bought a pair of those, and I ran six miles in Mirror Woods the first time I put them on. <laughs> huge uh, mistake. Yeah. Huge yeah. mistake. Yeah. I was sore for two fucking weeks. And I could hardly <laughs> walk around. It's it's funny we're on this we're on this kind of um, this minimalist shoe approach, and I actually funny I have a story. You remember Dustin, Danny? Yeah. Dustin's a friend of mine, but. He ran his first marathon in a brand new pair of Vivo barefoot shoes, um, and he had the same issue. He crashed and burned really bad. But um, with all this minimalist shoe stuff, you know, there there's something. There was always some research, and I I want to say it was from the book Born to Run. You know, they go they do this back and forth between telling the story. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, and if you guys aren't familiar, you should check that book out. It's actually a pretty good one. Um, but in there, I want to say there was some there was an antidote about. The softer the shoe, your feet are so um, – there, there's the nerve endings and there's so much going on there with the foot that the softer the shoe, your foot's actually going to hit the ground harder. I mean is, is that – have you seen any of that I mean in your research or um, are you familiar with that um, antidote in that book? Yeah, that's – that's actually it turns out to be exactly the case. So if you okay, look great. at – like if you go on YouTube and you look at the impact force and there's a bunch of videos of like a force plate coupled with um, a foot striking the ground on the heel and on the forefoot. And when they hit on the forefoot, it's a nice gradual curve of the force loading. And on the heel, there's this big impact, whether they're wearing a shoe or not. When you land on the heel, you get this big impact. And um, so the shoe, it has this cushioning, but it's, it's still you're getting more force with it. And one of the things that came up in, uh, in this research was this one study that looked at a group of people, not just running, but uh, basically load-bearing activity barefoot. And they were measuring over a period of time the length of their longitudinal arch. So basically the arch in your foot, the longer it is, the flatter it's going to be. And what they found was a group of people that the more weight-bearing activity they did, the arch got shorter relative to the control. So basically their arch got higher and stronger. Yeah. And in this, a subset of that group, the, the group that was doing more activity um, outside and, un, and on uneven even surfaces had the, most, uh, the, the biggest increase, so the biggest change and improvement in strength in their foot and arch. And the reasoning behind it was that these nerve endings, which the bottom of your foot is very sensitive, like the palms of your hands, the bottom of your foot, very sensitive. Like you step on that Lego, it kills, right? That's right. <laughs> oh, that's every day for me. I step on yeah. Legos all the time. Freaking talking kids. to two guys with kids and toys everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So what I what I found and what kind of was it, was it made it click for me was that the mechanism in the skin that's actually picking up the sensation. So there's three main ways in there, which is basically indentation, so like poking the skin, uh, shearing force, basically a force, a sliding force parallel to the surface of the skin, and vibration. So those are the three main ways that these these nerve receptors in your skin are actually picking up sensation. Hmm. 
So when you have a traditional shoe, you're still getting all that force going through it, but the mechanism that picks it up in this sensitive area is is blocked basically so you have that force going through it but you're not able to feel it so that's why when you're heel striking with your cushy shoe on you're landing even harder than you would if you were barefoot uh you know and running and running softly but you feel it even less because just the mechanism in there that picks it up so the benefit for the casual runner or the casual anybody i mean we hear a lot of stuff in the folks that we follow you know, Donnie Thompson, for example, power lifter, if you go to his gym in Columbia, South Carolina, him and all his people are barefoot. If, I mean, until they need to get into the squat rack heavy, they're barefoot. And, and a lot of times they're going to do their light sets barefoot. So for, for the for the for the average training person, you know, what's the benefit of being barefoot and just I, I guess in my mind, exposing your foot to the proper operations of feeling out those three um, mechanisms for feedback. Uh, so specifically for running, you're going to feel the ground a lot yeah. more. But when we talk about training, just being more aware of how you're positioned. So if you're if you're working on your technique and you care about what position you're in when you're you know squatting or deadlifting or whatever it is, if you can't feel what position you're in, it's tough. Especially you know you have a lot of weight on your back and there's a lot of things you're focusing on. You want to make it as easy as possible to know what position you're in. And another side from the lifting, I think, you know, you don't want to have uh, a soft shoe where you're kind of wobbling around and it feels like you're, uh, yeah, but. Yeah, it's like those uh, Hoka's, I think they're called, the really thick ones. You know, I I tell you what, I've got some older uh, ultra endurance athletes and they they just like swear by these things. Um, And it's, I don't know, I've never, I've never run in them. They're, they're enormous. If you haven't seen, if you don't know what a Hoka is, go Google it. It looks like a like a platform shoe from like the disco era. Like it's, it's pretty crazy how thick it is, but, but I think it's essentially flat though. Correct. Yeah. I, I haven't worn them, but they are, it's basically like an inch and a half of cushioning, which it has a relatively low drop. Right. So you can land a bit more midfoot, um, relative to having that high drop, which basically forces you to land on your heel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine you're feeling much when you're wearing them. No, you can't. I'm sure you can't yeah. feel anything. It's, it's like, like uh, stepping on a marshmallow. Yeah, uh, basically. It, but I tell you, for me, one thing that I noticed when I, when I was in the army, I ended up having to teach a lot of running courses, just from performance, injury prevention, whatever. It's it's all the same. And and uh, one thing that I would have my athletes do a lot would be would be run barefoot in the grass. And then put their shoe on and try to, you know, make it feel as similar as when they were running without shoes on. And and, and from doing that, I would, we'd try to have them do that like once a week as a skill opportunity. And I, I would get this anecdotally. People would come in and they're like, man, my foot is is like really loose in my shoe. And, and as, the, as their foot would strengthen back up, the arch would tighten back up. And sometimes they'd have to go down like a half a size in their shoe. Um, you know, so I, I, from the research that you looked at that, did they actually look at like, any correlation between uh intrinsic like foot strengthening or them doing barefoot style running and then injury rates in in when they were wearing shoes like running uh, related injuries uh that specific study i I think it just kind of concluded on the the uh just the length of the arch but there's a number of studies looking at um mechanics and an injury rate right uh there's another one that came out um i think it was last fall it was published and they looked at uh, groups of runners over two years and the group that was uh that suck out medical treatment for injury so they basically had pretty significant you know relatively uh running over related or overuse injuries and on force plate analysis, they were by far the heaviest runners in the in the test subjects. Oh yeah. And the group that was never injured was, as a whole, by far the lightest landing. So right. if, basically, if you look at the lighter you land, you know, on average, the less stress you're putting on your body, and the less the less likely you are to get injured. So that's right. why when you run barefoot and you work on that technique and you work on landing softly, you're you're improving your technique to injury prone or injury, reduce yourself. Thank you so much, gang, for tuning into today's episode of the Doc and Jock Podcast. We hope you're enjoying the topic of the day or the interview. If you are, please head on over to iTunes and review it and let us know so we can either talk about that topic again or bring that guest back on. Also, guys, while you're at it, post a question 
and then Dr. Danny and I can tackle that question on our Friday short. The topic could be mobility, weightlifting, motivation, anything in between. Dr. Danny and I will tackle that. It's a great service to us, a great service to you. You get some knowledge, we get a bump in the standings, and we really appreciate that. Also, guys, we'd appreciate your support in all the social media outlets. Check out at Doc and Jock on Instagram and at Doc and Jock on the Twitter feed. And also, guys, like, share the Facebook page and visit www.docandjock.com. You'll notice, guys, we're in the middle of a rebrand. We've changed the badge. We've changed the logo. We are overhauling the website, and we'd love to know your thoughts on that. Thank you, guys, for tuning into the Doc and Jock podcast. And remember... If you have a body, you are an athlete. Interesting. So talking about this research, I'm actually sleeping with a um, physical therapist <laughs> who's doing a research study. She's looking at my wife, by the way. Um, Is it a lot and, of sleeping? This yeah, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of sleeping, especially this past weekend. But uh, it was a great wedding. Uh, thank you, the Suikos, for the great time up there in, uh, at the Finger Lakes. Um, highly recommended to get up there. But uh, uh, she's doing some stride frequency um, um, observations paired with injury rates. Um, have you seen anything along those lines? Because right now she's looking at about a couple hundred cadets, and what what and it's just observational based on what their stride length is, and then some some survey stuff. Um, is there anything in that regard to, to stride length? Uh, yeah, definitely. So basically, if you look at running, the, the, a, a, bit, a big issue with this heavy impact and this heel striking and overstriding where your foot is coming down in front of your center of mass, that's when you get this big impact. Mm-hmm. So that means you're just taking long strides and you're taking too much time to get your foot around from push off to, to landing. So if you increase your stride rate and you work on your cadence and upping your cadence, you're, you're going to be taking shorter strides and thus... Uh, less impactful strides. Does does distance matter? And this is for Danny and and uh, Alex. I mean, someone like me. I mean, I can sit here and say, we know there's different intensities when running, right? If there's a four forty meter dash versus a mile run, um, it, talk to me a little bit about the difference in the mechanics uh, and the intensity required for the two. But still, I'd imagine the technique would be somewhat similar where we still want to be on the midfoot, correct? And this is for both of you guys to just kind of have a round robin about. Well, it, it, I think that there are some similarities and differences between sprinting and distance running. And, and most people, when you start to accelerate them to a faster distance run pace, they, 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 it's hard for them to heel strike. Um, yeah. Because in order for them to increase their speed – if they're already if they already have a long stride, a uh, extended stride, the only way for them to really increase their speed is to increase their cadence. And when they increase their cadence, it tends to bring their foot under their center of mass more, and they, they turn into more of a midfoot striker. But when you look at sprinters, in most cases, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a like a fast person run yeah. on a heel strike. You know, um, so the issues with odd. long the issues with long slow folks who don't know what they're doing. It's generally not the athletic population. Right. And, well, I, I think you also you know made a good point about the the noise at which you hear people run. Like you know, I mean, I could basically run around during PT hours when I was in the army, and I could I could tell who's going to get hurt. I mean, I could hear them. They sounded like uh, like a Clydesdale. You know, like one of the things that we would always tell people is like run like mm-hmm. a ninja, like you're trying to sneak up on somebody. You know, like I don't want to hear you run because if I hear you run. You have to think about the ground reaction of that, right? So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so if you hit the ground hard, then the ground pushes back into you hard. You know, if you hit the ground soft, then then you get less force um, through through your body. You know, as you do that. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think there's some similarities, but I don't know. What do you what do you think, Alex? What have you noticed that? Um, in terms of the uh, the distance, well, I think one of the big issues on distance runners is that they get tired to the point where they can't maintain proper form, yeah. mm-hmm. but they're not tired to the point where they need to stop running. So there's a disconnect where they might get tired and their form is going to break down after a mile, but they're running, you know, five miles or 10 miles. Yeah. And now they're, they're going to do those miles, but they, they don't have the, the strength or the endurance or the stamina or whatever to maintain proper technique, but they're still going to crank out those miles. And when you start doing that, that's, you know, your form is breaking down and now you're doing most of your reps with shit form. Yeah. And it's just a motor pattern that you're practicing. So if you do, you know, 90% of your reps with crap form, that's going to become the default. Um, so, so trying to break that cycle, like if you're a distance runner, trying to break that cycle to, to, 
to be able to maintain uh, good form over that distance or whatever you're doing, that's, that's kind of the goal. And I think what, uh, what Brian McKenzie and what they're doing with CrossFit Endurance and Power Speed Endurance and their training methodology is to say, you know, you're training for this longer race, but if you keep doing these long, slow miles and you're doing most of them with crap technique, you're going to have crap technique. So if we can say, let's, let's take a step back and do and run until our form breaks down, stop, recover, and do that again and repeat that. So do, you know, like 400 repeats, 800 repeats, mile repeats, and work on that technique. So now you're getting a lot of those reps with good technique, and that will become the default. And then, you'll, you know, you'll have the strength and the endurance to, to do that on race day. It, it it seems to me like for a lot of years, and, and we're all decently young folks here. I mean, um, me and Danny are in our thirties. Alex, I didn't mention what you late twenties, late twenties. You, you in thirties yet? How old are you, man? Twenty four. Oh, you're a young. You're you're a puppy dog. But yeah. I guess the the point there too is, I mean, in my mind, when I was coming up in PE class or sports coaching, no one ever taught me to run. And and to me, you do some digging. It seems like. You know, even in the 80s or before when jogging became big, there was it's no jogging, em- by the way, it's a soft yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was no emphasis on the skill of running. And, and it seems now we're, we're coming around where, like you said, you mentioned some folks doing that. So um, was, is that something and this might tie in really good with the, with your product? Is it is this is this uh, the shoe cue? Is this a product at, as as an attempt to give some feedback for folks to not only just practice their skill of running, but also get some feedback if they're doing it correctly. Yeah, exactly. So like back to the barefoot versus shod running, when you're barefoot, you feel how, how you're moving and you, and when your form starts to break down, you feel it and you're going to self-correct. Uh, the, basically yeah. the initial goal was barefoot feel, but in your shoes. So restore the sensation. So the product, it has this textured heel plate. So there's bumps on the heel to wake up the nerve endings in your foot like we like we had talked about so it's basically just getting that sensation but back in your foot um yeah yeah well i mean i when i used it um you know it's definitely something that i've worked a lot on running technique just just personally because i i actually had i had a lot of um uh running related injuries when i first got in the army i mean I, i played baseball like the furthest i ran was like 60 yards you know i mean i maybe further if i hit a triple and that was it like you're not running for conditioning or, or anything it's a completely different sport but get, get in the military and then all of a sudden everybody's a runner and not only that but they run a shitload every day and they have no they, they have uh, poor programming for that i mean and when you look at how much running they're actually doing based on what their but what, what their job requirements are it's kind of silly that you're just going to do a bunch of long you know slow running if your job is to carry gear around and 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 run quickly so you don't get shot so regardless i'll get off that soapbox but here's here's what i noticed was you know as i did that it was it, a lot of it was all about hey how do we retrain you from this heel strike which i have no idea how i developed it to um more of a midfoot forefoot strike and uh and a lot of it's just drills and repetitive you know training it's very hard to feel that though i think that people have a challenge with it with it, something that that is so ingrained in them uh to to make a change in that and then ask them to hold that for a couple miles it's really hard most people can't hold a decent form for 200 meters when they first um learn it so i, I thought it was interesting because it kind of for me it kind of helped me give me something to not want to feel whenever I was running, I guess that's a better way to put it is, is that if I felt it, I knew that I was probably loading there a little too much. Or if I felt it a lot, I knew that I was loading there too much when I was letting my heel touch down. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of, that's, that's what, you know, basically the goal behind it uh, specifically for running. So like if you're doing these drills and you go out and run and your form breaks down when you get tired, which it does pretty quickly yeah. uh, for most people to, and, and without any reinforcement and actually your shoe making it comf- comfortable to run with crappy form, that's a problem. Like you're not going to correct. So what we're able to do with the shoe cue is when you start breaking down, like if you're actively working on your form, you, you know what you're, you know how you're trying to run. And when you start breaking down, you're, you're aware of it. And just to get you to be aware of it, you can make the correction to yourself and say, Hey, you know, I need to be pulling my foot up faster. I need to, you know, my posture is breaking, whatever it is. And you know, so you know how you're moving and just, so basically bring awareness uh, back to the way you move. And I think one of the other things that we've found, which is very cool, which I wasn't totally sure uh, how it would go initially, but from a lot of testimonial and feedback from runners who more on a passive side, like they don't really know what to expect. They don't even know how they should be running. Um, 
but telling us that when they start running with the shoe cue, they notice that they're just slightly leaning forward a little more. Their, their you know, turnover's a little bit faster. They're landing a little bit lighter. And then, you know, maybe that's the first run, and then the next run, it's a little better, and it's an incremental improvement each time. And then, you know, maybe a month later, they notice a large difference in their, in their gait and their motor pattern without really putting in that, that active effort, which I think is, that's a very, um, you know, something I'm very uh, excited about and I want to get some more research on. No, I think that sounds really cool. But, and I'll say, you know, aside from training, you know, I've been tinkering with, with the shoe cue as well. And I've, you know, I'm not an avid runner. I'm, I'm more of a weightlifter, right? And um, where I'm interested in it, one is just kind of walking around in it. Right. I mean, I'll just have it in walk around shoes. Right. So um, and it's been a benefit for me in that regard to just kind of get a little bit more forward. And um, like I said, I've I've enjoyed it there. But where I'm really interested is getting back into some weightlifting gear. I do a ton of um, alternative weightlifting drills where I'll actually put my lifters in a heels off position on like a three quarter inch mat and just to get them to again to me, it makes sense to lift weights like an athlete, right? To push through the midfoot and to get full and total foot activation. Have you guys had anybody outside of running tinker with it or any other exercises and seen some benefits with the shoe cue? Uh, yeah, we have a lot of CrossFitters using it for lifting and Metcons. Um, and actually one of my partners is a CrossFit coach, uh, and, you know, he's got everyone in the gym using him. We're, we're, you know, getting him to a lot of CrossFitters, a lot of top level uh, people who like him just for weightlifting because just by being more aware of how they're moving. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, what, we, you know, in squatting, we always talk about, you know, drive through your heels. Um, first of all, I, th- I think that cue is kind of. It's trash. Yeah, what is what? Are, what are they trying to say? Like you, sh- yeah. your whole foot should be connected. And I think yeah. what they're saying is don't you know don't load your knees first, load your hips first. Yeah. Um, but to get you to be, you know, we we want to get your foot in a more neutral position so your whole foot's on the ground. So if you're loading your heels too much, that's a problem. So we want to say if you're more aware of how you're standing, you can get you know you want to get the ball of your foot on the ground. You want to get your toes down. You want to get a nice stable arch. And just through having more awareness you know, you can be more conscious of it and, and do that. Yeah. My thought on the whole drive through your heels cue and, and, um, to me it's a, you know, when CrossFit comes out, it's not a lot of great squatters, right? It's people who are asking to squat who don't. So I actually think the drive through your heels is probably a really good corrective cue, but I don't think it's the one that's going to promote the, the optimal performance down the road for, for the, for the whole of the athlete. Um, um, so if, if you're moving junky and you got to sit back to get a better squat, I see value in it, but not, not, it shouldn't be the end game to kind of push through the heels. And that's where I'm really interested in experimenting with, 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 um, the shoe cue to, to actually get with it. How, How about high force, landings like you know obviously power snatching power cleans we're, we're going to find the ground really hard after leaving it well any research on you know because again you do have the little dots on the heel right so have folks given any feedback about man that actually hurts my heel uh i'm not doing anything super heavy like that we have yeah. guys doing it and they okay. do like it um the bumps you know it's kind of a, it's it's subtle it's not like a spike um, oh no, it's not bad. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. So it's not really, you know, you're aware of it, but it's not painful. So I haven't had any complaints uh, with that. Uh, generally, it's been a, a pretty good consensus. Um, either people like it or they're kind of indifferent, is what we're hearing. Great. Uh, from the from the weightlifting standpoint, what's the process like? I'm kind of fascinated with the process of. Okay, you have this idea, and that's great, but implementation uh, is the hard part right so like people have good ideas all the time but and they never turn into anything uh so what it, how did it go from this idea that you had to you know now it's you know you've got it out there on the market and you have people using this product and getting some good feedback from it um so right when i had the idea i really wanted to try it out so i was you know i was pumped up to try it out and uh i thought about what i could put in my shoe to get this sensation so i went to the hardware store i picked up some sand some sandpaper discs like 60 grit or some real rough thing yeah. and uh, i put them in my shoe and took them for a spin ran like half a mile and it did exactly what i thought it would like it made it feel natural to run 
uh, with that four foot strike, uh, which I always found it was, it felt kind of awkward in my traditional shoe as opposed to uh, barefoot. Um, so I was, you know, real jacked up about it and I ended up taking my shoes off and they're bleeding a little bit because it was uh, a little pretty rough prototype, but the concept worked. Um, to go to implementation of an, like turning it into an actual business, that was a, a bit of a longer process. So and, uh, I, I, I want to go back to the Genesis story because when we talked with uh, Bobby Edwards of Squatty Potty, he, you know, the Squatty Potty came from his mom being constipated. So was there is there a little anecdote story about you know I mean, you just wanted to be a better runner and through your research was was that it or was there kind of idea to say hey throw this in a sock or throw this in my insole? Um, I mean, I, I did the research because I was interested, but the actual, the, the, the first prototype, I was kind of scratching my own itch. Like that's why I did the research. Yeah. Um, and it turned out, I, 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 you know, came across something that turned out to work out pretty well. Um, and then, yeah, that first prototype, you know, I, I just tried it and took it for a spin. There was a little, little bit of a, uh, a gap there from, from that moment until we actually officially started working on it as a business. Um, it's funny. I almost see like an SNL skit where you have like, 20 people in a room and I see all these little because I've seen the shoe cue it's it's a small little plastic heel insert in the insert but I can almost see like a thousand different versions with bigger bigger dots little dots more dots less dots how many molds did you go through to find I mean I'm sure there was some trial and error to find the exact right one yeah um I bought a 3d printer so like a, a cheap 3d printer and just started you know, building CAD models and printing them out at my desk and throwing in my shoes and taking them for and just and just running in them. So I went through some pretty uh, wacky designs in the process. So ones with like big sharp spikes or ones that basically look like a Lego brick and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff and kind of settled on a, a certain a certain size bump and a certain layout, which works pretty well. It's so obviously, you know, this is version one, so it's not perfect, but it's it's. It's definitely a lot better than the alternative. That's really interesting. I, I was at uh, this. I was at a business conference back in September. It was a physical therapy business conference, and there was a company there that was it was three D printing orthotics. So basically, I didn't know what three D printing was. I mean, I guess I'm you know in my mind I'm thinking pr- like a printer, right? Uh, and it's 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 actually it's crazy what they do with just like different layers of material, and then it builds this uh, this product. But yeah, so basically they would like they would have you step on. Um, whatever it was, and and uh, and then they would build a custom orthotic based on your foot with this 3D printing. I'd never seen it before. So, you know, when you use when you use that um, in terms of you know making an orthotic, how do you how do you go about picking the materials you wanted to use? Was was there anything that you wanted in the forefoot because that's such an important area as well? We're trying you're trying to get them to load more in this forefoot midfoot. So like, um, how'd you come up with? the heel to toe ratio and the product like we were using for materials. Is there anything reason for that? Uh, so the forefoot, we basically just used kind of a traditional foam. We wanted it a bit cushy to, and, you know, we're encouraging people to, to land there. So right. we want to make it so they're not going to, you know, bruise their forefoot. Um, in terms of the ratio of the heel to toe, that was basically a lot of trial and error. Um, and part of the reason why it's not just the heel and goes under the arch a bit is that if you're, you know, when your arch collapses and you're in a bad position, you should know that. So you should feel it and, and correct. So whether your, you know, foot's turning out when you're running or, or squatting or whatever, and your, your foot turns out, your arch collapses in, you know, we want to make you aware of when that's happening as well. So that's, that's kind of the reason it goes a little bit longer. As well as that area under your arch is a bit more sensitive. Uh, you know, the skin's going to not be as tough, so you're going to get a bit more sensation from that part. So Danny brings up the arch and, and the drop and whatnot. Do you have a recommendation for – can you throw this in any shoe or do you recommend a zero – because I, I prefer as close to a zero drop as possible. I like it to just be a nice flat shoe with the wide toe box, right? That's what I'm going to look for. Um, I That's why I kind of like the older version. My favorite shoe is the very first Nano. It's yeah. just the shoe that I like the most. Um, it's not very rigid. I can move in it whatnot. And, but – um. Do you have a particular shoe recommendation, you know, based on your research that you throw somebody in or, you know, somebody new to running is going to toss their shoe cue in a shoe? I mean, what's your recommendation there? I think the end goal should to get should be to get to a relatively low drop shoe. Um, yeah. But for people who are 
running and have been running for a long time in a, you know, a bit more cushioned, a bit higher drop shoe. I think, you know, if you're working on running technique specifically, start working on your technique. And then once you get improve that, then start transitioning into, you know, maybe a lower drop shoe and make sure you're working on that mobility and especially in the ankles. Um, but so you can start working on your technique in any shoe. And this is a, a you know, a tool to help you do it. Um, and you can still heel strike with it. It's not painful to heel strike. You're just going to be more aware of how you're running. So we're, we're not saying like, it's not like shocking you when you are in a bad position and just, you know, be a little more aware. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. I get shoe Q 2.0 with the, uh, shock yeah. you. <laughs> you know what I get jokes. sometimes I'll run barefoot sometimes. And if I land funny, I'll actually get like a pain in my, my, my jaw. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can, it just vibrates throughout my whole body if you land on that heel the wrong way, you know. So um, maybe you can just, uh, you know, hook some up to people's teeth or whatnot. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a neat product, man. It, and it's you know what, what I like about it too is just again the same reason I like the squatty potty. It's a very simple mechanical intervention to just get you to do something a little bit better. So this thing isn't rocket science, but you know you got a smart guy like yourself digging digging into some neat research, something he's interested in, and then. You just it's cool to me that you you found a way to make something that you thought would make you run better and now all of a sudden you're trying to get it out to the masses and then um it's a neat intervention, it's a cool idea and um it's neat to hear that there's some real thought behind it and you're an advocate not only for the sport but for the product itself. So that, that's really cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know and and um you know I guess if if people want to find out more information about this product if they want to uh you know kind of reach out and, and, uh, and see what you guys are up to. Where can they find out some more information? Uh, shoeq.com, S H O E C U E. And, uh, or find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter as well. Uh, Instagram's probably where we post the most content. Um, and if you want to shoot us a message, Facebook, or, you know, there's uh, email forms on our website, which is probably the easiest way, but whichever. Sweet. And Alex, I'm going to do you solid. I'm going to mention this on the show. When I was at this wedding, and I mentioned it pre-show to you guys, and this is for all the listeners, not only if you're not a runner, but you're a big beer drinker and you play uh, <laughs> while you drink beer, I'm not very good at that game. But I don't know if it was the beer or the good times or the shoe cues that I've tossed in my dress shoes, but I couldn't be removed from the from the from the cornhole board. I was on it five five games, five wins. I had to walk away from it, but. Uh, <laughs> It probably wasn't the twelve year olds I was playing against, but uh, whatever, we'll work that out. But uh, uh, like I said, it's cool. I've been walking around in it, and even as a weightless weightlifter, I'm really intrigued by it. So, um, fired up, man! Really cool episode. And uh, Danny, I think the shoe cue might help people prove that uh, if they have a body, they're an athlete. Fired up. What's up, guys? Doc Danny here with the Doc and Jock Podcast. And when you get a chance, head over to MobilityWide.com. You can get two free months of programming and subscription to MobilityWide Pro by using the code Doc and Jock when you sign up for a yearly subscription. This is a pretty cool service. They've got daily mobility wads that are programmed. They have case studies where they look at specific issues like, hey, maybe why you're having shoulder pain and how to deal with that. They even have webinars in specific areas like the lower back or the ankle. This is a super helpful resource for yourself if you're an athlete or if you're a coach you can't go wrong with this save two months use the code doc and jock no spaces and enjoy the information